Hi, I'm Bernard Leung and you may know me as the executive who has a strong opinion on blockchain and made a 5x return through investing in cryptocurrencies. And in my spare time, I want to know more about how blockchain technologies put together an ICO. You're listening to Analyze Asia, the weekly podcast dedicated to business technology and media in Asia. And today I have Federico As, founder and CEO of Claros and my former classmate from the Global Solutions Program 2016 in Singularity University. And I know he teaches in Coursera too on blockchain. Welcome Federico and it's great to have you here for the first time and this is an interview that's long time coming. Yeah, thank you Bernard for having me. I'm very excited about being in Analyze Asia. And it's also good that we have a catch up this year earlier in Singapore where you visited and I think part of it was because you were trying to figure out what is happening with blockchain across Asia. I think you've also been to Hong Kong as well, right? Yeah, so I did an Asian tour that took me to Seoul and then to Hong Kong and to Singapore because you know in this uh, blockchain world a lot of things are happening in Asia, so it's good to be connected there in the ecosystem. So yeah, and it was great to see you again after GSP. I want to start off by getting to know you better. I do know we spent like two and a half months together, so but my audience would want to know, how did you start your career? Sure. So I was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina. I went to the economics and then I studied philosophy. I started my career in the online media world. I work at the most important newspaper in Argentina in the online business section. So I was an editor there. So that got me connected to the startup world, innovation world. That's how I got to like know the blockchain. So it was, I guess, in 2012, maybe 2013, that uh, people were starting to speak a lot about this cryptocurrency. At the moment, it was only Bitcoin. That's how I got interested into that because being from uh, Argentina, you know, it's a country that had lots of problems with currency because of hyperinflation, bad governance, and that got me interested in, yeah, so what is the thing about this currency that is not created by a government and that people can use it like very easily, like for doing payments without uh, friction. So that was my early days into the blockchain world. Like nobody used to talk about blockchain back then. It was only the, the Bitcoin, right? The internet money. So I'm now started to work. I was interested so in the legal part of the blockchain phenomenon. Like in 2014, 2015, people started to realize that the blockchain can be used for more things than just cryptocurrencies. And I was particularly interested in the applications on governance. And within governance in particular, to the um, use of blockchain to create uh, justice systems that are more like transparent, cheaper. I started to work on the intersection between like crowdsourcing and blockchain, how to build new system for arbitration. And that's what took me to Singularity because I wanted innovation, a competition in, in Buenos Aires. And the prize was, yeah, go to Singularity. And that's how we met Bernard. <laughs> so that's my story. You've got to be very modest about it. While we were in Singularity University, you were busy speaking in conferences on blockchain in Silicon Valley as well. Am I right to say that? Yeah, so <laughs> back then, so yeah, when we were in, in Silicon Valley, it, it was um, June 2016 to September. Uh, yeah, there was actually only one conference about yeah blockchain, and I was speaking there as moderator of the panel about blockchain and governance. So that was very cool because you know something, Bernard. I think that Silicon Valley actually got like late into the blockchain uh, revolution because I guess that it's a different way of building like the internet, like different from these very big monster companies that were like the business model of Silicon Valley, right? So the the Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazons. Well, Amazon is not from Silicon Valley, but it's the same. So one thing I was quite surprised when I went to Singularity and lived there. So it's like, yeah, like Silicon Valley seemed to be late uh, into the blockchain ecosystem. You have moved from online media into blockchain technologies, which is probably in the forefront of what is going on in the internet world. So in your career journey, what are the most interesting lessons you can share with my audience? You know, I got into the blockchain like world because I was connected to, yeah, of course, innovation, internet. So I was always interested in the new trends in, in the internet. But, you know, I wasn't like really interested in cryptocurrencies at the beginning of the phenomenon. So, yeah, I was interested in that. In, in, crypto, in crypto because yeah okay this is innovation and financial innovation that's cool but you know when people started to think and to speak 
about blockchain applications of governance applications of, of blockchain that was when i really became really interested in this technology because i was actually really passionate about solving the problem of access to justice and it turned out that like blockchain was like a really important technology for that i guess my career decision was okay i want to solve this problem of justice and so and what is the appropriate tool for this so it happened that blockchain was a really good tool for that because of smart contracts and they enabled transparency but something that we learned i think uh, when we did a singularity program that's like become passionate about the the problem but not the, salu- the solution what you see like lots of times into the this blockchain space is like people trying to like retrofit problems into the technology so that was very different for me like if it turned out that the, the solution to the access to justice probably was i would be probably doing like ai now and not blockchain so <laughs> that's a, like a very good very big piece of advice that i always give to entrepreneurs that want to like they are in career transitions and they want to know what to do next it's like yeah what is your passion what is the problem that you need to solve and then start to focus on the technology and these days i hear entrepreneurs are now spewing the jargon you know it's just not about blockchain plus ai plus iot plus da, 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 whichever tech you want to have but the main topic of the day is I want to talk about the story of Claros, but from a viewpoint of how does one actually get an ICO to happen? I think there are a few strains of your story that has a lot of link to what is happening in Asia. I think the first is actually building up a company that invests into blockchain technologies to solve a particular problem. And then followed by you have to come to Asia because there is the regulatory pressure is far less stringent as compared to maybe other parts of the world. And apparently Asia is now the hotbed for all blockchain technology. So I think that there is these trends that will make your company very interesting to talk about your story. So before we start, can you describe your current company, Claros, and what is the vision and mission? Sure. So Claros is a company that uses a blockchain to create a decentralized organ which can be used to arbitrate all types of disputes. So because of different trends in the world economy and yeah, change in technology, so we have now lots of disputes that are becoming global and digital in nature. For example, I, I am in Argentina and let's say I hire some guy from Singapore to build some for a product for me or some website now we have a problem we have a dispute between like so us accord on the scope of the job to be done like i'm not going to singapore to go to court against this guy so to recover my money and in particular if like it's a 500 or 1000 dispute like it's not worth it how can blockchain help here imagine i can instead of paying the contractor directly I put the money into a smart contract that works as an escrow and the money is going to stay there. And we both agree that if there is a dispute, so this is going to be arbitrated by, right? So I put the money into this escrow smart contract. And so if there is a dispute, the money stays there. And so now Claros is going to select a jury of experts in website. And these guys are selected by a system that is like random and they are going to analyze the evidence, the website and the con- contract we did with the contractor and so and they're going to vote uh, who is right so if i win then the money that is put into a contract is going to be sent back to me automatically and if i lose the money is going to go to the contractor the losing party fee of the arbitrators this provides a solution to lots of different disputes that like native to the digital age they are uh, like in many ways cross-border uh, like lawyers, they bring um, the solution for this because and they are not really interested in like five hundred dollar dispute. And this is a quite simple example of what Claros does. Uh, but so Claros can be used for lots of different disputes. For example, in crowdfunding disputes between a team that did a crowdfunding campaign, and so there is a dispute between team and the backer to define if the next payment should be done because the team did the team reach or didn't reach the next milestone. Like lots of insurance disputes, maybe payments disputes. There are lots of applications for this, mostly in like small claims. So Claros is 
protocol on top of which lots of different companies will be able to different applications to solve different problems. So that's clear in a nutshell. It's like taking a very big trade arbitration dispute and then try to turn it more micro. That means more for the day-to-day -day people where they're trying to settle maybe something around $1,000 to $10,000 contracts because these are much more frequent in terms of trying to do proof of work. Is that how I understand it? Yeah, it's correct. So basically, um, the most, um, the, 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 I guess the people like, if you, you know, the 99% of the disputes that ordinary people have in life. So it's like small, small claims, small scale dispute, like you, you and your credit card company because they charged you for something that you didn't want, or you and your uh, utilities company and that kind of disputes. Um, so um, this is, this could be, uh, potentially be used for more complex disputes, but that's not the low hanging fruit. It's going to be in the beginning, at least being, it's going to be used for like these small claims mostly. I guess as the founder and CEO of the company, how do you assemble your team together to work on this protocol? Sure. So that's a good question. Um, I, I was working on the problem of justice inclusion, like before Singularity, uh, as you know. But the Claros company only started after Singularity. I, there was a, a hackathon, and one of the juries of the hackathon was my friend Susan. She is the founder of a blockchain company called BitNation, that they do governance using blockchain. And she was a jury, and she sends me um, an email, and she tells me, look, there are two guys uh, who presented a project that this, she introduced us to Clement and Nico, who are my co-founders now. And we talked, and we saw that we shared like this same vision of having a decentralized justice protocol. And we started working together. Like This was early 2017. We have grown the team from like the, the three of us, basically. We are 13 now. We have people in different countries. I am in Argentina, but we have people in the US. We have people in Peru in Canada, in Germany, uh, Serbia, we have people in India, China, I'm forgetting some countries, but <laughs> so yeah, we're everywhere. As far as I know, many blockchain projects tend to be very multinational from the very start. How do you get different people from all over the world to work with you on your project? I think this is something that people don't talk about a lot. You know, it's like people, like, w w what is the, the most important thing at the beginning of, of a startup? Like, it's the vision of, uh, yeah, of what you want to accomplish. We started to present this idea at conferences, get to connect to people who share the same interests, who share the same vision. Well, they come and, like, they say, hey, I want to, I want to participate here. I, I, think, I think that what you're doing is valuable and I think that this is something that needs to happen and I have this skill and I want to be part of that. And also, remember, being open source protocol. We are building something that, it's not that we are the owners of Cleros. We are the catalysts of Cleros. But someday, if we are successful, this is going to be a decentralized organization that, that nobody is going to own. So want to be part of this, of this project because they see that the problem we want to solve is a very big problem in the world. They feel like it's a, like a journey in which they want to take part. As in every startup, I guess, um, it's like, yeah, it's being part of something that's going to be potentially very big. And we have, so, you know, the blockchain space is really, really competitive for talent because there's not a lot of like developers in blockchain. But we have no problem at all having like top world talent for a company. So that's, we're very happy about that. How did you start by putting an ICO together? I mean, what are the initial steps that you need to do in order to start putting an ICO for Claros in order to create liquidity and at the same time also funding the project? And developed it. So the first thing that you need to like ask yourself is like uh, very honestly, like, do I need a, a token sale? And first, do I need a token? <laughs> because it's not obvious that like all the 
platforms require a token. In our case, we do require a token because all the process for selecting the jurors for the disputes is done through a crypto economic incentive system that requires jurors to stake a token to be drawn randomly as jurors between like many other candidates. All the incentive system is based on the use of a token, right? So the thing is that I would say that many ICOs and I would. I don't want to say most, but probably it's most. They don't really need a token for their platform. They just could have done replaced their token by just uh, ether, right? The first thing to ask is, okay, do I need this? <laughs> do, I need a, do I need a token? And then after that, you have to figure out if you want to. Even if you need a token, so there are different. Uh, you can have a token and not do an ICO because you can distribute the token like with an, with an airdrop and finance the project in a different way. So if you decide to go token sale model, then you have like lots of conversations to have with, with your lawyer because you need to figure out, so okay, so what kind of token do I have? Because if you have a token that produces a number of consequences that like a security, some jurisdictions may think that you are doing an unauthorized the security offering, which is not legal, after to, to, to see if your token really is, is a security or a utility. In our case, the token is a utility a token because a portfolio is a, it's used for uh, the users of the platform to be drawn as jurors. But so if you have a token that looks like a security, like you need to find and have a number of approvals by the relevant authorities for them to accept that your token is for you to do an offering of a security. Lots of the, I guess, the um, work to be done requires like lots of legal advice. And then, of course, it's about uh, showing the people that you are building something that is that is worth building and that solves a problem. So in many ways, it's not uh, different from uh, like ordinary startup, you know. So does your solve a problem? Is this a problem big enough? Does it have a business model? In some ways, it's still, you, you still need to do like a business thinking. And then, of course, you have to see how you're going to market your ICO. Like a bad idea is to market the ICO like a kind of uh, come here, buy this token and it will, will go up like in five months, it will go up 10x or something like that kind of advertising. So that attracts the wrong kind of buyer mostly. Remember, all these platforms are building some services that are going to be used in the long term. So if you do like some marketing that attracts like short term buyers, so that's not necessarily what you want for the health of your project in the long run. It's like a startup having the wrong kind of investor is bad because you need to have alignment between your goals and the goals of the investor. So in the blockchain world so it's a bit of also the same you need you want to have a community of users that are going to help you promote your project they're going to use your project and they're going to become like evangelists of your project like you don't want a community of people that are going to come every day say hey when when is it token going up to the moon and that kind of stuff because that's the kind of thing that you don't want that's a bit how the process goes and also you have to have lots of like technical expertise to build so yeah because you need to to build a platform and so you have to make sure that there are no bugs into your platform because you can have like your money stolen by a hacker that kind of stuff there are companies that do this auditing for your code we did a a different type of ico so we did an ico that's called interactive coin offering that's uh, suggested by Vitalik. It's a different and more fair way of doing the sale because you let people who participate like have more control on the valuation on which they want to participate. They also have the certainty that they're going to get into the sale if they want. So yeah, there are many, many like uh, ways to do the token sale and there are lots of things that you have to juggle i'd say because yeah it's it's complicated but as every new thing in the world <laughs> i'm interested to know what do you need to do to separate claros from icos out there who are out to make a quick buck or smearing the entire space as sham or ponzi schemes as an observer i think 99 percent of the icos are just plain garbage 
I don't even have a feel for it. But I, I just want to get, get a sense of like, I think you did something pretty different in the way you put your ICO together. You didn't go out and raise a hell lot of money. You raised it just enough. And then at the same time, you're trying to solve a very big problem. And they're so competitive with so many blockchain companies out there. How do you distinguish yourself in order to get more people into Claros then? Sure. So the first thing is before doing the, the token sale, we already had very advanced prototype. Like we had a prototype that everyone, anyone could use. And so people could see that we were actually building something, right? We're not doing that just some sale of some digital asset. Second, about the team credibility. <laughs> I am known in my in the blockchain community. I am a professor and I, as you said before in Coursera, I, like, I have a PhD. So my co-founders also, they are people who are known into the blockchain ecosystem. So we present at good conferences. We have like a vision. You, you have my, our white paper is a white paper that is thoroughly like constructed. That's on the project side, right? And then also on the way we did the, the token sale, we did it in a very different way from most. For example, we didn't sell most of the tokens. We just sold 16% in the first round, and we plan to do other rounds in the future as we achieve some critical project milestones. People are going to see what we accomplish in the future and the achieving us the funds to move forward with the project. So this looks a bit like ordinary, traditional startup world, right? Startup in the old world, they used to have access to more resources as they could prove that they could move forward in the direction that they promised to the backers. They didn't get all the money at once, like as in the in the token ICO world. So we structured the token sale in that way, right? From the point of view of, of buyers, yeah, so you see that, so these guys are doing it the right way, right? So they're going to sell apart to get access to funds to move the project forward. And then they are going to, they are successful and they find product market fit and they can show that they, move forward with the development so they can have access to more resources. So that's another thing. So that <clears throat> sets you apart from all these token sales that sell most of the tokens at the beginning with some like very dubious communication of, uh, yeah, you can buy our token and ICO. So, and we did a, a different way of uh, token sale uh, from most other companies. So there are two main ways to do a token sale. One of them is the cap a token sale where you have a fixed valuation and the buyer knows at the how much is going to pay for the token. But so what happens is that when the token sale starts, lots of big whales they like rush and buy tokens first. And so the small guys they don't really get into the sale because everything is sold out before they, they can get in. And then the other way of doing it is the um, uncapped sale. So that in this one you don't have a, a, a fixed valuation so anyone can get in. But you know, the problem is that so since the amount of tokens is not fixed, so you may end up having a very small amount of tokens. Right? So, and that's not a good thing for, for a buyer. We let every participant decide what is the valuation at which they wanted to participate. In our method for token sale interactive coin offering, each participant can decide what is the valuation at which he wants to participate. So imagine I only want to buy tokens in this project if the valuation is below 100, then if the valuation is above 100, I am refunded the money that I bid. So that allows for like all participants to have control on the yeah on what they buy and at what price they buy. So if you put together this having a product, having a prototype before starting the token sale, having a good team and having a good white paper and having a ethical token sale method. So that is what sets you apart from all these other like token sale projects out there in which I have to agree that many of them are really like yeah, really bad quality. So this is the part that I always find it very fascinating and nobody actually ever tells me. So how does one get their ICO or token into a cryptocurrency exchange? Can you run a blockchain ICOs without getting involved in an exchange? There is this ecosystem that always grows when an industry is growing, right? So a lot of the things that happen in the crypto world, so it's like you do the ICO and so your buyers, they want to have liquidity and they need to have the token sold 
into a exchange that has lots of users so they can sell it. So ended up with cre the creation of like exchanges where the exchanges that got lots of traction and lots of users, they were in a position of lots of power in which they could like charge companies for like lots of lots of money. Like some exchanges like charge like over one million dollars for being listed in their exchange. So this market is created that you don't want that because in the end Remember, it's like you are a company that you have still to build a product. You have still to prove to the world that you are building something that the people want and that people are going to use. And like, can you afford to pay an exchange like $1 million of the money you supposedly need for paying your developers? Can you pay that to an exchange that just to have your token listed? So that's a, a, like a bad thing of this world. And we don't pay for for listing in exchanges right there are some exchanges where our token is listed now some of them are free some of them are not free but we don't we don't pay and eventually bernard what's going to happen is that good exchanges are going to start listing the tokens that are from good projects and these tokens are are going to be listed for free because in the end what's going to survive is that uh, people so it's, it's it's the project that solve a problem and that where the tokenomics makes sense i think that now we are in this transition phase from this crazy crypto ico world from this like bubble into the rationalization that happened in the early internet days remember the bubble of the 2000 and when it popped so this is happening also now. As you know, some of the companies survived in the first internet because they had business models and they had a vision. And others, like pets.com, <laughs> that didn't have a, a good business model, but they got lots of funding, in the end, they, they failed. So if you don't have a good project, even if you do like a multi-million dollar ICO, so it's, in the end, it's going to fail, right? You can't uh, throw money at a bad project and try to do it good. I think what we're, go what we're going to see in the coming months is like the cleaning up of the crypto ecosystem where only the good ones will survive. I have a slightly different view. I think we're still not at the dot-com bubble for blockchain yet. <laughs> Oh, what, what, you, you think that the, the, the pop has not come yet? No, I think that where you are at is a little bit like the early days between 1993 to 1995, where people heard of this technology called World Wide Web and people were buying URLs. I think we are at that phase where people are starting to figure out what to do with these URLs, which is the blockchain technology. And I think that there's a second wave coming that will actually, where you start to see one or two applications that becomes a killer app. That is when another wave will start. So I'm still thinking that there is still a stage away before we actually go into the actual bubble. But that's my view at the moment. That's totally possible, I think. So the, the thing is that as for now, like we don't have very good use cases. Like, yeah, we know that crypto can be used to make payments. Okay, yeah, we, we know that. But we have not yet seen the like blockchain 2.0 use cases work like a lot and i think that should come in the coming months because as we all know so if the technology doesn't solve a real life problem then it's not a very good technology right we are still trying to see what are the the real uh, use cases for this everyone in this ecosystem is trying to figure out that and we think that we have a a quite compelling use case and then it's about execution you know it's interesting because at the moment a lot of people thinking about the blockchain space very centered around korea japan singapore to a certain extent hong kong but china has totally taken it from a different direction they ban icos they ban cryptocurrency exchanges but they have been investing a lot in blockchain technologies in fact in the last one year i've seen a lot of technologies being applications being built on blockchain in fact i think just uh two weeks ago shenzhen has issued blockchain invoices i mean it may work or may not work but at least they're showing something that you know these things that people have been talking about about blockchain they're trying to show that these concepts work i think this is something that is not talked about i think a lot of the media is centered about oh China banned this, China banned that, but they, fo they totally have not looked at the innovation that's happening in China itself. You know, you can have blockchain and you can have like, yeah, decentralized organizations without like ICOs. Like Bitcoin didn't do an ICO. 
they just mined the, the, the currency, right? The ICOs, I think the first one was the master coin ICO. It really started with Ethereum. So, but yeah, like in the end, it's about finding the use cases and China may have some things to do. I know they are very interested. The thing is that in the kind of use cases that do they need blockchain or they could do it with a centralized system, right? That's a very big question. Yeah, that's right. So as part of the effort to put an ICO and also understanding uh, what Asia is doing, you came here, you visited Seoul, Hong Kong and Singapore. What are your impressions and why have you decided to come to Asia to see what is happening? Well, it's no surprise that Asia is a continent of of the future. So this counts for every industry. And of course, the crypto is one of the main growing industries in the next, I'd say, 10 to 20 years. But not only crypto, I'd say. Like fintech, legal tech and gov tech are the like the big transformations that the digital yeah era has not like or is 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 already it's only starting to affect we we know that the internet changed like information the email yeah wikipedia uh, the record companies all that the next wave is about fi- finance law and governments i think that in asia what I saw is different type of ecosystems. What I saw in, for example, in Seoul, Korea, was a an ecosystem very focused on the short term short term gains and trying to do the yeah the the fast ICO to make a quick buck. I think that uh, what I saw in, in Korea was mostly about that. I didn't see like projects that were trying to build something for the long run. It's not that they don't exist, but I didn't see them. Then we have, of course, Singapore. I think that the government had like the vision to try to foster this fintech ecosystem. And I think that they understood that they need to attract talent for that. And they give like lots of advantages in tax, for example. So it's no surprise that Vitalik actually moved to Singapore. In Singapore, I really saw a really sophisticated ecosystem with good projects, for example, a Kyber Network, a good uh, VC ecosystem also. For example, Fembushi, I, they have this, they're, they're mostly based there. You Singapore have Professor David Lee, of course, that he's a very important man in the, in, in the crypto. And then also in Hong Kong, there is a bit like, I think it's more focused into the VC part. I saw like less projects coming out from Hong Kong, but yeah, lots of funds in in Hong Kong. I think Pantera is from from there. What I saw is like uh, growing because I, I don't know as much about China because I didn't go there. Japan has some interesting things going on, but of course, I think Singapore is like by far of what I see the most sophisticated and advanced ecosystem in in Asia for for crypto. What have you learned about the regulatory frameworks in Asia? And what how does it distinguish from where you come from, which is Argentina and the US? I mean, Latin America is a very, very different world as compared to Asia or compared to the US. Do you see very different regulatory frameworks that have emerged on cryptocurrency, blockchain, and all these fintech uh, that's going on? I think the governments are basically trying to understand what is so um, I, I have to seem like really very big um, so Singapore yeah Singapore is, I think is very advanced in Argentina for example the government just starting to learn about this you know Argentina has a very important ecosystem of projects in the blockchain space because of how the history of the country had hyperinflation and we had bad governance and so we a system that didn't work. So it's no surprise that people started to become like interested in blockchain and crypto at a very early stage. So there are like projects coming out of Argentina. The government, like it's far behind. Hopefully they will make the decisions that are going to help keep the companies in Argentina. Because you know, the thing about blockchain is that since the companies are global, like my company is like global, right? People are everywhere. So if the if some country starts to put some very hostile attitude toward crypto, so that country may lose the competitive edge in yeah for for innovation in this space. So Argentina for now it's uh, incognito. Uh, I think Singapore has a really good job into attracting good projects there. So good job and. That's why you are at the cutting edge of innovation. The U.S., I think that the U.S., 
like needs to be like um, very forward thinking about how to do this. I don't know what the SEC is thinking and all the other regulators, but the, if you think it through, like the US is on the losing side of the crypto revolution because, for example, in the crowdfunding, right? Um, so what it's doing is it is democratizing access to capital. Like some guy now from Argentina can launch a project that can have a global impact and they can find capital and resources from everywhere. So in a, like 10 years ago, the, the only way to do it I, I, I was going to Silicon Valley, right? And because that's where the ecosystem of venture capital was. Now talent is everywhere. Capital is everywhere. Like it's becoming really global. Who is the one that's going to lose with this? So it's the like incumbent, uh, which is the US. So if they try to be very hostile to this like crypto, well, we know how it ended for those who were hostile for innovation, right? We know how it ended for the record companies and the, yeah, and the retail, old retailers and those who didn't adapt. This is going to, like crypto is going to keep working forward and change the world. So, and every country should try to see how to better fit into this um, new ecosystem, but that's going to be exciting times ahead. And... I think this is a story that's going to be continuing to talk about and it would be great if I can get you back on the show again to talk more about Claros and some of the things that you've been seeing on the blockchain world, not just in Asia, but also all the other parts of the world. So Federico, many thanks for coming on the show. So in closing, I need you to do two things. One, can you recommend a book, podcast or anything else that had work that had impact to your work and personal life recently? Yeah, sure. So some books I recommend, like of course I would recommend uh, The Singularity is Near by our friend Ray Kurzweil, <laughs> Bernard. Like uh, I also recommend uh, Peter Diamandis' Abundance. Uh, that's awesome. It uh, gives you some like overview of a number of trends in the world about how technology is changing, not only in crypto, but in like VR, AI, biotech and stuff. You really need to read uh, Steven Pinker's The Better Angels in Our Nature to see that any even if it seems that the world is going like past with all the populism and like, bad politics and stuff. It's still progressing from the long-term point of view. Of course, the three books by Yuval Harari, uh, Sapiens, Homo Deus, and the 21st Challenges of the 21st Century uh, are very good to see where we come from, where we go, and where we are. Podcasts, I recommend listen to like Epicenter in, for crypto. I recommend a very good one. It's called Analyze Asia, of course. How do my audience find you? Of course, you can find me at um, Twitter, at Federico Ast. You can find me, I guess, you can come to our Telegram group in Kleros. You can find our uh, more information in our website, kleros.io. But if you want to get in touch with me, you come to my Twitter, send me a message, and we, we, we can talk. You can Google me at Bernard Leong, and you can find this podcast at iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Spotify. And of course, tweet to me if you have any feedback. Give us a five-star on iTunes or a star on Overcast and Pocket Cast. And of course, tweet to me on your feedback. So once again, Federico, very great thanks for you doing, in coming on the show and I look forward to speak to you soon. Sure, Bernard. Uh, thank you for having me and hopefully we'll see we meet again very soon in Singapore.